All right. Well, hello, everyone. This is Geology 105 uh, virtual lecture. Dr. Tinsley here, and uh, it's good to be with you all again. Uh, we're going to travel through this semester together as we finish up in a virtual environment. And today, this week, we're going to be talking about earthquakes. So let's get going with this lecture. Uh, again, these lectures are short, I know. Um, just hang in there, read your book, ask me any questions that you have. I'm happy to answer them. I've had some people ask me some questions. I think I've answered them pretty promptly. So uh, let's keep plugging right along here, and we're going to talk about earthquakes. Now, a lot of this is going to be reviewed today, so that's a good thing. We all know that earthquakes, right, are vibrations of the Earth's material caused by a release of stored energy. We've talked about this already. We've talked about that that energy radiates from a point where the release starts. We call that point the focus. That's the actual point down in the Earth where the earthquake starts. And we said the epicenter is the point at the surface directly above the focus, um, so we can place it on a map, right? So if we look at our diagram here, there's the focus down below and the epicenter up above. The focus is an actual point. The epicenter is just a reference point on the surface directly above the focus. We've talked about this already, so this should be reviewed. Um, we call that energy released seismic waves. We've talked about that. And uh, seismic waves are picked up by seismic stations, which are found all around the globe. And these stations record the energy release from these earthquakes. All right. So, again, largely review, I hope. Now, when we talk about earthquakes occurring, if we go back to our diagram here, you'll notice that that focus is right along a fault. So we've got the fault where there's movement of the hanging wall and the foot wall. You know what those things mean now. As you can tell, this is a reverse fault, right, because the hanging wall is moving up relative to the foot wall. But there's movement along that crack or that fault, and that's, what ha that's <clears throat> where earthquakes occur, right, faults. We said a fault is a crack along which motion has occurred, joints are cracks in the rock along which motion has not occurred, so just a technical difference there. Um, and again, we talk about faults a little bit later. Uh, actually, we don't talk about faults later in this lecture. We've talked about them in the last lecture. Um, but as we've talked about many times in the past, faults and fault movement is usually related to plate tectonics, and we've talked about plate tectonics at length. So all of this is starting to relate to each other. I hope that you see that. And uh, we've talked about elastic rebound theory as well. This is how uh, seismic waves are generated. We've talked about rocks being deformed, uh, but they don't break. They just kind of store that energy uh, of deformation and then uh, as potential energy. And then later that energy is released when there's a slip along that fault, right? So the fault slip uh, causes that energy to be released. The slippage occurs at the focus, the weakest point, right? And when the rock springs back, and the stored energy in the rock, when it springs back to its original shape, because remember it's just deformed, storing up that uh, potential energy, that release, that springing back, creates vibrational energy, which we call seismic waves. We talked about this. This is not new. Hopefully, I think it's like the third time we've talked about it, so you should be getting really good at the elastic rebound theory at this point. We've talked about foreshocks. Those are the small earthquakes that come before the main earthquake. These are typically small adjustments that happen right before the main adjustment, the big movement, right? And these can proceed by days, weeks, months, um, any really any amount of time. Then there's the main shock, the main earthquake. This is the main adjustment. This is where the main major part of the energy is released. These are where the most intense shocks uh, are, are, are found. And this is where most damage occurs, right? And we know this. And then we have the aftershocks, which are, again, kind of like the foreshocks are small earthquakes, but these come after the main earthquake. And they are the small adjustments that happen after the main adjustments. And again, they can follow by days, weeks, months, even in some cases, years. All right. We, uh, we talked about, about the study of earthquakes. We call that seismology. Uh, the first seismologists were really the Chinese. The Chang Heng dynasty, uh, or Chang Heng rather, in the second century AD, created the first, what we believe created the first seismograph, which was a tool to measure earthquakes. Um, and seismographs measure seismic waves to determine the intensity of the earthquakes. We know this, right? And then the seismogram is the record 
of the seismic wave or the printout. So just, again, some terminologies. We, we And, again, I'm going through this quickly because this should largely be review. And we looked at the first, or what we believe to be the first seismograph, as it were. Um, I told you how this thing works. I'm glad I was able to teach you about this in the lecture. But as you remember, the steel balls in the dragon's mouths, and when the earthquakes would come, the balls would theoretically drop into the frog's mouths. Uh, I doubt that happened very frequently. Uh, and this was because these, these dragons were all around uh, the exterior of this device, and there was a pendulum on the inside swinging and banging in against the inside wall. The thought was that you could probably tell what direction the earthquake came from um, by which balls fell out. But I've surmised and, and hypothesized that all the balls probably fell out in major earthquakes in China, so it didn't matter anyway. But this was a first attempt at a seismograph. It was good, and, uh, and we have it now for posterity. Uh, the seismographs that we use today uh, operate on this principle, as we talked about the weight hanging from a spring, which is freely floating, right? And then uh, you've got the little drum, rotating drum there below, rotating with a piece of paper on it. And when nothing's happening, the, the line that's created on that rotating drum would be a straight line, right? But when the base there of the, uh, of, of the device starts to shake, and that arm that's up there, the L-shaped arm that's up there starts to move around, Theoretically, the spring and the weight will stay in place, right? The, pr the principle of inertia. And, but the base is moving around. So the base is moving around, but the weight is essentially staying in place. Then it creates the squiggles on the rotating drum. And the size of those squiggles tell us how intense the earthquake is. And again, we've talked about this in class, so hopefully this is review. We said that this is what a seismogram looks like. Uh, you'll see the main shock there up towards the top quarter. And then about halfway down, you see that little uh, waveform that's formed there. That's an aftershock. Um, uh, higher than that main shock, you can see some, uh, some little teeny weeny shocks that might be uh, uh, four shocks. Uh, but they're hard to point out on this one. But anyway, you'll see. This is what a seismogram looks like. We said there's two types of seismic waves. It's the surface waves and the body waves. And I love that this is review, so we can go through this quickly. But surface waves are seismic waves that travel along the surface of the Earth. We said they exhibit complex motion. They cause lots of damage. They have great amplitudes. And they have the slowest velocity, which is one of the reasons they cause so much damage, because they hang around a long time. Body waves, on the other hand, are seismic waves that uh, travel through the body of the Earth. We said they exhibit simpler motion patterns. They cause less damage. They have smaller amplitudes and the fastest velocities, right? So we talked about the body waves, the P waves and the S waves. You'll remember that the P waves are the compressional waves. Uh, they're the fastest of all seismic waves, and they travel through all types of materials, solid, liquids, or gases. S waves are the transverse waves, the up, up and down waves, the S-shaped waves that we traditionally think about when we think about waveforms. Uh, they're the second fastest of all seismic waves, but they only travel through solids because they're shear waves, and so they can't sh you can't shear gases, you can't shear liquids, you can shear only solids, and so they only move through solids. Um, so these two waves are fundamentally different waves. Uh, top there you see uh, compressional waves. So compressional waves move particles closer together and further apart as they move through a material. Uh, and so in this case, the propagation is left to right, and so there's compression, expansion, compression, expansion, compression, expansion as this waveform moves. Transverse waves, on the other hand, or S waves, are the more typical uh, sinusoidal S-shaped up and down waveforms that we're used to seeing. In this case, the propagation is still left to right, but these waves move up and down. So their movement is vertical, whereas their propagation is horizontal, whereas with compressional waves, Movement is horizontal and propagation is horizontal. They're parallel with one another. So you can see, again, that these are fundamentally different waveforms. We talked about surface waves. There's two basic types, the love waves, which have a side-to-side -side motion, and the Rayleigh waves, which have up and down and compressional motion. We looked at those. Uh, the love waves at the bottom there, you can see that diagram is trying to show you side to side motion these can be very destructive waves because buildings buildings can go up and down uh buildings can kind of rock a little bit left left and right under compressional forces like p waves they don't do very well side to side 
And so love waves are very destructive. Rayleigh waves are very destructive as well because they not only have an up and down motion, but a compressional motion, a side to side motion. They're very complex waveforms. Now, we're going to talk about locating the epicenter of an earthquake, but I think I'm going to I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but you're going to do a lab this week that's going to help you understand how to do this. Uh, but to, to locate the epicenter of an earthquake, you got to you do it by, by the PNS waves. So body waves, PNS, this is where they become very valuable to us as scientists. And what you first do, well, and you find this by looking at the difference in arrival times at seismic stations. So PNS waves, because they're different velocities, are going to arrive at different seismic stations at different times. Uh, and seismic stations are all over the world. In order to find the epicenter of an earthquake, you got to have at least three stations. We call this triangulation. Uh, and so once we have three stations, we can determine the PNS wave arrival times at those stations. We can determine the epicenter of an earthquake. We can say where the earthquake originated. The procedure is really simple. You find the difference in arrival times. Then you use what's called a, a time travel graph to determine the distances from the epicenter. And you draw circles on a map to see where they intersect. You say, what in the world are you talking about? Well, I'm going to try to go through it real quickly here. But we're going to do it in the lab, and you'll see when we do it uh, in the exercise this week. But first of all, we look at the PNS wave arrival times. And I'm sorry, there's a little glitch in my um, in my system. You'll, every now and then you'll see that rainbow pattern pop right there, like right there. Um, it may go and start flickering here a little bit more frequently. Um, and I apologize for that. Uh, it's a little glitch in my system. I'm hoping that it'll hold out for the most part. Uh, for our time today, but it looks like it's going to start causing me problems here. Um, all right, maybe not. I apologize. But what we do is see, see the P waves and S waves. I got them marked there with the arrows. So the P waves are starting right where the P wave arrow is, and the S waves start where the S wave arrow is. They're, they're easy to see because P waves are smaller than S waves typically. So where you see the the little waves start, that's P, and where you see the S bigger waves start, that's the S wave start. Um, you measure the time difference between those two. And in this case, it's about 24 seconds. So that's step one. Then we say we go to a time travel graph. So knowing that it's 24 seconds between each one, the top curve, so you see the yellow shaded area, the top part of that yellow shaded area, the curve there, is the S wave curve, and the P wave curve is in the bottom one. And you can see that as we get further and further away from the epicenter, which is at the origin of the graph there, zero, the zero, zero, zero point, the bottom left-hand corner. So we get further away from that point. You can see that the PNS waves get further apart, and that makes sense, doesn't it? Because if, if the P waves are faster than the S waves, then the further they get away from the epicenter of the earthquake, the further apart they should be. So the further apart they are when they arrive at my seismic station, I know the further I am away from the epicenter of the earthquake, right? Does that make sense? I hope it does. If it doesn't, again, hang in there. The lab will probably make it clear. So if I know I have 24 seconds between the two, what I have to do is find the vertical line in that yellow area. So i got to find the vertical line in that yellow area where there's 24 seconds of time between those waves. And where I find that vertical line, I read straight down, and it tells me the number of kilometers or miles or whatever your graph is in that my station is from the epicenter of the earthquake. Then if I find the distance that a station, my station is from the epicenter of the earthquake, and I find that for three different stations, then what I can do is draw that distance, because it doesn't tell me. It just tells me a distance, right? It doesn't tell me what direction it is. So I've got to find that distance at three different stations. So we've got, in this case, Charleston, South Carolina, Detroit, Michigan, and Minneapolis, Minnesota. I draw a circle at that distance around each one of those seismic stations, and where the, epi where the three circles intersect is where the epicenter of my earthquake is is. And again, this is totally what you're going to be doing <laughs> in your lab exercise this week. But that's the three steps. That's the three steps to finding the epicenter of an earthquake. Okay? You got it? Probably not. That's okay. We're going to do the lab. Uh, most earthquakes occur in a narrow belt around the region. So what we find is there's three principal areas where we find earthquakes occurring in the world. Now, they occur all over the world, but these are major areas. The, the Pacific Ring of Fire, the, the ring around the Atlantic Ocean, or excuse me, the Pacific Ocean, uh, all the way around the rim of the Pacific Ocean, you have 
volcanoes and earthquakes. And that's because we have a lot of subduction zones, if you remember from our plate tectonics lecture. Uh, because of that, we have a lot of plate tectonic movement and activity. Therefore, we're going to have a lot of earthquakes. Also, the oceanic ridge system, the mid-ocean ridge system, is a place where we find a lot of um, um, uh, earthquake activity, which makes sense. And then in the Caribbean, actually, is one of the top three areas where we find a lot of uh, earthquake activity occurring on an annual basis. So when we find the epicenter of a lot of earthquakes, we're going to find them in these areas. Uh, hundreds and thousands of earthquakes every year occur in these areas. There's the Pacific Ring of Fire. You can see west coast of North and South America, all the way around the Aleutian Islands to the north. Japan and uh, uh, Indonesia and down around Australia to the Tonga Trench and all the way down to the Philippines and New Zealand. There's our mid-ocean ridge system. The white lines indicating the mid-ocean ridge system. As we said, it's like a seam of a baseball all the way around the globe. Lots of earthquake activity there. Now we're going to talk about measuring earthquakes for a minute. There's two ways to measure earthquakes. One's called intensity and one's magnitude. Intensity really is an indirect measurement of the amount of the earth vibration. And it's based on damage done. So what we do when we, we measure the intensity of earthquake is we go out after the earthquake and we say how much damage was done. More damage, the bigger the earthquake. Uh, the most famous scale for this is the modified Mercalli intensity scale. It was developed based on uh, California building standards. It's a scale from 1 to 12. And when the earthquake happens, like, geologists go out and measure 1 to 12, the intensity of the earthquake, 12 being the max. The problem is the destruction that they see may not be a true measurement of an earthquake's energy release because buildings in California are built to high earthquake prevention standards. And therefore, um, the damage that you would see, be at, say, at a 6 or a 7 in California, might be a 10 or an 11 in, in other places in the country, because, say, in Virginia, because our buildings aren't built to that code. So if we had a large earthquake here in Virginia, we'd do a lot more damage than at the same intensity earthquake in California. So... Because it's an indirect measurement, a lot of people don't like intensity scales, right? Because they don't give you a direct measurement of the energy release. Most people like magnitude scales because they are a direct measurement of the amount of energy released using equipment like seismograms. Uh, the most famous of these, obviously, is the Richter magnitude scale, which measures energy release. It's developed by a scientist named, a uh, geologist named Charles Richter. And what it does is it measures the amplitude of the strongest wave in an earthquake. And because it's measuring amplitude, it's a direct measurement. It's a scientific, as it were, measurement. And uh, it, it, it's, it's a lot more uh, sophisticated. And most geologists prefer it. The Richter scale, uh, however, is not a 1 to 10 scale like most people assume. It's actually, a, mathematically, it's a negative 10 to infinity scale. Uh, but... Most of the time, the numbers in the Richter scale are going to fall below 10, which is why most people think of it as a 1 to 10 scale. Um, now, on the Richter scale, earthquakes of 2 and below, we usually don't feel. We have 2 and below earthquakes here in Virginia all the time, but we don't feel them because they're so light. Um, yeah, so there you go. <laughs> Had another thought, but it went away. Uh, now... A lot of people think going from a 1 to a 2, 2 to a 3, 3 to a 4 on a Richter scale is no big deal, but it is. It's a huge deal. For each 1.0 increase in the Richter scale, so you're going from a 3 to a 4 or a 4 to a 5 or whatever, there's a 10 times increase in the amplitude of the waves. 10 times, folks. So when I go to 1 to 2, the waves are now 10 times bigger. There's also a 32 times uh, increase in the energy released. So when I go from a 1 to a 2, I'm at 32 times the energy release. Crazy, isn't it? So it's a big deal when you go from, you say, well, I, was it a 6 or a 7? Ah, it was a 7. What's it matter? It matters big. All right. Um, earthquake measurement, uh, is, uh, magnitude scales, um, they're logarithmic, so they get big fast. Um I'm not going to worry about moment magnitude right now. You don't need to worry about that uh, at this point. Uh, it's a little too hard to explain without being in the classroom with you, and it's not that important anyway. All right, so there you go, Richter magnitude scale.
Now, earthquake damage, how much damage is done in an earthquake uh, depends on a lot of things. Number one, obviously, the magnitude of the earthquake, how big it is. The duration of the earthquake, how much does it shake? You know, if my earthquake only shakes a few seconds, it's not going to do as much damage as if it shakes for five minutes. So that makes sense, right? If I shake you by the shoulders for a one second, I'm not going to do as much damage to your neck as if I shake you for a minute. Right? Don't worry, I'm not shaking anybody. But you get what I'm saying. Uh, building codes in the area where the earthquake occurs. If the buildings are built to earthquake standards, less damage is going to occur than if the buildings are not. We see this in places like Haiti uh, and the Caribbean when they have major earthquakes where things aren't really built that well. Uh, there's a lot of toppling of buildings, a lot of destruction of life. And then, of course, the geology in the region. Uh, what's ha what, what kind of rocks are underneath? That matters uh, in earthquake uh, damage. Okay? I've shown this picture before. Got the building on the, uh, the two buildings on the left, the one that says Santa Claus and then the one just to the right of that one. Those were more modern buildings in this 1969, no, 64 earthquake in Alaska. Um, and they fared very well. Not even, none of the glass is even broken in those buildings. But the building on the far right, the larger one, the one that has the most damage to it, uh, was made out of wood and was an older structure and was completely destroyed uh, for the most part in that earthquake. Why? Building materials. It mattered. Same earthquake, same place. But the construction materials were different. More damage was done to the older building. When an earthquake occurs, it's not just the earthquake we have to worry about. There's a couple of th other things that can happen depending on the geology and all that around the earthquake. One thing is called liquefaction. If, if the soil in an area has a lot of water in it, during an earthquake when everything's being shaken up, it can actually act as a liquid and move around like a very thick, viscous liquid. And then after things settle down, it'll kind of settle back into solid soil again. Um, Obviously, liquefaction can do a lot of destruction. So liquefaction is something. Tsunamis, uh, big ocean waves, right, that form during the shaking of an earthquake can be a major uh, problem. Uh, landslides and mudslides, as you can imagine. Fire becomes a major issue during earthquakes, especially in municipal areas where there are underground natural gas lines and fuel lines and things like that. They can break open and catch on fire. And then, of course, dam damage, uh, cracking of dams. That can then result in flooding, as you can imagine. So, um, yeah, a lot of things can happen in earthquakes, not just the earthquake itself. All right, so that's the lecture. I know that's probably quick and dirty, but read your book. Uh, listen to this lecture. You can listen to it multiple times. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, do the lab. The lab is going to really open your eyes as to how to locate the epicenter of an earthquake. And again, I think this... This lecture was a lot of review. I hope it was. And, uh, and I hope you've enjoyed it. And I hope you're enjoying the class. Again, I wish we could be together. But that's not in the cards right now. But we will do the best we can. And we will continue to press forward. And we will get you through this course. If you have any questions along the way, I am available. Hit me up on email. Call me. Whatever you need to do. I am here for you. All right, folks. Hope you have a great week. And I will see you soon. Bye now.